Welcome back to the channel, everyone. It is time for the How I Make My Gaskets episode by popular request. And I was surprised at how many people said they would enjoy watching an episode on how I make my gaskets. Uh, for me, I it's just a mundane activity that I've performed over and over and over again for the last couple of decades that I would just as soon rather be able to skip altogether. But it is a handy skill to have when you're working on obsolete machines that don't really have gaskets that are pre-made and readily available. There was one comment from before though that I would like to touch upon. And uh, he said, new way to make gaskets, scan part and laser cut gasket works a dream, just bringing you into the modern times. And that's all well and good. And I will agree that is a very accurate way to recreate the gaskets that you need. The problem is though, we all have to learn to crawl before we can walk and we need to be able to walk before we can run. Too many times in our modern era, we want to take workers, people, students, and just throw them straight into the running phase without having an adequate grasp on the basics and the fundamentals and everything that came before the uber specialist kind of scenario that we see ourselves dealing with now in the modern workforce where they're only really trained to operate very well, but they can only operate between a very narrow set of parameters and any time the requirements of the task wanders outside of those parameters, they're basically ineffective. So we're not going to do laser cutting and scanning and all that other stuff because when you're working with machinery and equipment, you're not always in a convenient place that has electricity even, let alone access to a computer and a scanner and a laser cutting device. And a lot of times if you're broken down out in the bush, if you had a thick piece of paper and a ball peen hammer and know how to make a gasket, you can at least get yourself out of a bind and back to a place where a proper repair can be made. So let's begin. We'll use this tractor engine that I've been working on recently because it's the perfect example of why it's handy to know how to make your own gaskets. I did purchase a pre-made gasket set for this engine just in the interest of saving time. And most of the gaskets in here are very good. You know, they, they will do the job like this intermediate cover to block gasket no problems at all. But they included several front cover gaskets in the set because it's it's for more than just one engine. But none of them are cut properly to have all the bolt holes line up and to make it work. So we're doing pretty well over here. But then we go up into this zone here. That one's close enough to work. This one's only about half in alignment. That one's only about half this one's maybe a third out, and then these two come in pretty well again, but there's no way to manipulate this gasket and make everything line up and work. So my thinking here is if they don't even have all of their dies in proper order to ensure you're going to get proper alignment and have a workable gasket, did they also give me substandard gasket material that may seep, oil, cause leaks, uh, I don't know. So what I decided to do, because both of these pieces are under so many other things on this engine, I'm going to remake these two gaskets primarily. So I've already remade the intermediate cover gasket out of a known good grade of gasket material. And it's a fairly straightforward deal. So we've got this one out of the way. And because this old gasket was good enough to work, already I just used it as a template to make this one but we don't have that opportunity with the front cover gaskets so we'll make those from scratch. By far I am a fan of the ball peen hammer transfer method all right and I've had other people talk about uh, using like a, a transfer ink that they put onto the surface and then they just place their gas material on it and then that leaves a negative that they can then work if that works best for you or you have other means of doing this, by all means, stick with it. Uh, moving forward, this is not me telling you how you have to make gaskets. This is just me showing you how I make gaskets. So your mileage may vary. But we've got our piece of gasket material. It's the correct thickness, the correct grade of a known quality and spec. And we'll cover this uh, more into that later. But making sure we don't have any edges sticking out 
and okay we're good everywhere so to start with I'm just going to find a bolt hole there's one right there and I'll take the rounded end of the hammer just tap that material into that bolt hole just enough so that it recesses into it that not only defines the perimeter but it's also going to hold the material in place uh, temporarily so I can get one or two more marked out all right and if you want to keep going with the ball peen hammer and just keep tapping you can actually punch that bolt hole right out because the uh, top of the opening that uh, sharp edge or that square edge will eventually cause the uh, gasket material to cut all the way through in my case I only marked them out just enough to flag their location to another one up here because I prefer to uh, center punch those out later center punching them is a bit cleaner because it doesn't mash the gasket material so badly around the perimeter opening but tapping them all out entirely with a hammer is definitely a viable alternative to punching all right we've got four holes marked out like four corners so now we take a minute to talk about the hole punches that i use before we go and start perforating that piece of gasket material this is um, very handy right here this little pliers setup it has this rotating head on it with all different size hole punches and there's a little detent that aligns it and there's like a copper soft pad to uh, act as a backstop this is really handy for very small gaskets like for carburetor float bowls things like that um, these punches here are what I use 95% of the time these are actually leather punches but they work just as well on paper the ends are very sharp and you use them in conjunction with um, this is a white oak uh, wood block and it used to be about that tall but I've made I don't know how many gaskets on this probably I've had it for 15 years and I just keep shaving the the surface down every time I wear it out but yeah you just uh, set your gasket paper on that and then hit your punch with a hammer that absorbs all the impact doesn't dull the end of the tool and the blanks will just migrate up and fall out that little opening on the side this is another handy punch set this is made for paper all right and you've got all these mandrels of different sizes that thread onto the driver handle and the driver handle has this spring-loaded center point on it so that helps you to put a mark on your paper to make sure you're centered up with the hole and then it's spring-loaded as well so after you go and pop the blank out that center um, punch portion uh, spits the uh, the little round slug back out so that it doesn't build up anywhere and then all of these over here you're starting to get a little bit specialized here I don't use these that often unless I need like a, that's a two and a quarter hole all right this one gets pretty big I'm not sure how they broke that but <laughs> they did at one time and these are mostly just like swap meat finds anytime I find a center or a hole punch that has you know it looks pretty good I'll pick it up because a lot of times you need an opening or you, you need a hole that's about that size and having these on hand comes in really handy for larger holes still we've got this modern plastic adjustable circle cutter has a sharp peg that slides back and forth to set diameter sharp blade on the end but if you want to get really serious all right the all packs gasket cutter super sharp blade sticks out that end be very careful of it adjustable center point we have ruler type graduations on the bottom and it's only the most remarkable tool ever invented would they lie fun fact that was me when i was 12. anyhow says it will cut gaskets from one inch to 36 inches in diameter and even compressed asbestos oh good times good times yeah we have these extension pieces that will go on to the cutter itself and you can do some pretty wide swings with it i mean swap meat finds everybody just the box alone would have sold it but then i find i mean everything inside even the literature so and it's still a viable tool really really handy stuff to have so back to punching the holes you can see how that ball peen hammer transfers a very defined 
uh, mark onto the paper and just make sure I'm centered up with it. Okay, it looks pretty good. It pops out a really nice, really nice uh, plug, perfect round opening. So we'll go to the second one. You can see it right there. We'll work our way around, pop all four of them out. There's our start. Back to the front cover again. Now we have our four holes marked out. I use just a selection of newer bolts for this. I'll drop bolts through every hole that I've punched because that is going to, this one's a threaded one up here, that's going to hold the piece of gasket material in place so that I can tap the rest of the way around and we don't get anything moving and migrating. Learned that lesson the hard way years and years ago. So once you establish some holes, it can't move from there. And we can lift the edge up a bit. There's the next hole right there. And once you know where they are, you can, you can feel it with your finger. All right, you know exactly where to start tapping. So we'll work the rest of the way around and finish marking all the holes first. All right, that was the last bolt hole, but we also have other special features to pay attention to. Up here, we've got this groove that also needs to have a, um, a provision cut out for it in the final gasket. So this is, it helps to know what you're looking at as well, but this is a, um, an oil passage, okay? It, it receives um, an oil supply from the engine block through the intermediate cover, and there has to be a hole in the gasket here to feed this slot because there's a small uh, orifice drilled right there where it'll spray oil onto the timing gears. So we definitely have to make sure we have an opening in place for that. And we have the benefit in this case of knowing how they formed it on the new gasket or if you're very careful taking your old gaskets off, you can also pick up a lot of these details. So you have to be sure to put all the holes in the new gasket that the old gasket has. Otherwise, you're going to wreck an engine. So we see it's just a long kind of, it's not even oval, it's just a, a slot with two rounded edges on it. Even though we've got this extra bump right there, we don't need to form that into it because knowing where the feed passage comes from, it feeds this into the, uh, the channel over there. Just having a good look at everything is really gonna help you to uh, drop bolts on the floor and know how you need to form your gaskets, so. What I'm gonna do is just, there we are, there's the end of it. Just transfer, just marks of the two ends of that channel because I know how it has to be formed after that. Get our bearings again for the next one, right where my thumb is. There, that should be enough. Yep, there's the other end. That should be enough to know where that has to be. And we'll have a look. Yes, good transfer. We know where that slot has to be as well as all of the through holes. We will put all those in it now. Very important we do that before we work on any of the perimeter stuff. It'll make sense in just a bit. That was the final round hole. And you can see how I just took a smaller hole punch and did each end of where that straight oil channel slot has to be. That's going to give us our rounded ends. And then I'll just take a sharp knife and cut the whole center section out next. There's our slot, opened it up. Another thing handy to have are these uh, modelers knives. Um, X-Acto knives is one brand. This is Husky. I'm not sure where we got them from. It's all the same. Nice precision, sharp blades, different handles, different profiles. They come in quite 
handy. So, yeah, good looking opening there. Back to the front cover once again. All of our holes are lining in very well. Yep, I like how all of that looks. So, we'll do the same uh, bolt drop in here to keep everything in place. Yeah, except we have more options to utilize now. I throw plenty of bolts in because you just you don't want it moving around. Throw that guy up here. So now we finally work on defining where the perimeter edges are. And now I just use the flat end of the hammer for that. Same goal as with um, defining where the round holes are. We're only hitting it hard enough to transfer a mark. But if you want to tap it long enough, you can cut the edge right off with just the hammer, if that's all you've got. All right, I've worked my way around the outside first and then back around the inside. So we should have a pretty good transfer of where we have to cut it out. And yep, you can see them, especially when you get in the light just right. Definite lines all the way around. Shows you exactly where you have to cut it. So we'll do that next. Nothing fancy here either. Just Arts and crafts time, everybody. Good sharp scissors. I use this larger set for these uh, uh, perimeter cuttings, but I've got these little miniature ones. If I have a very tight diameter, like curve that I have to cut around, like we'll get up, like maybe up in here, where you're, you're cutting a pretty good arc. These cut a curve a lot better than the bigger ones. They kind of hurt my thumb a little bit, but and pinch, they can really get you by. All right, we will keep the center scrap because there are a lot of smaller gaskets in there yet. That's still a very viable piece of material. So checking our end result. Yeah, all the bolt holes line up just like it's supposed to. Everything's looking really good. That oil slot is right where it needs to be looking good. And here is why I prefer to punch out all of the through holes first before I cut any of the perimeter shape because you get to thinner areas like around here. If I were to cut this perimeter edge out first and then start popping holes in there, that's not a lot of holding material there or there. So if I were to set this on top of the wood block, pound that hole punch down through, the gasket material could very well tear and split open right there and then the whole gasket would be ruined. So. That's why I prefer to put all the holes in it first because you've still got plenty of surrounding material. It adds strength to it and you can, you can just slam holes wherever you want. You don't have to worry about blowouts, anything like that. Another thing I want to talk about, it will require placing the intermediate cover on top of the front cover to illustrate how your gasket edges end up looking after everything has been assembled. So. Because we made our gasket according to the perimeter of the front cover, the intermediate cover doesn't quite go out that far. So you've got some surplus gasket sticking out along the edge right here. So after all these components are all stacked upon one another, tightened down on the front of the engine, I'll take a very sharp blade and I'll just go and score that excess gasket material that's uh, sticking out right off of there, cleans the joint edge up. We'll have to do it a little bit over here too. There's a little bit uh, stick out right there. Case in point example is when I made the gasket for the top cover for the back end here. I made it off of the case flange because that was flat level, solid, but we've got quite a ledge that sticks out right here and so did the new gasket. So after the top cover was on, bolts were tight, I scored all that excess off all the way around because when you put shiny paint on something, it amplifies any small imperfection like that and it would really become noticeable and just looks kind of ragged. I do that with factory made gaskets as well because very seldom do you have anything that matches all of your edges perfectly. 
All right, another request I had was to show how I make jointed splices in multi-piece gaskets. So when you're making your own gaskets, you'll a lot of times encounter a situation where one sheet will not do the entire gasket in one piece. So what you would do is make your gasket for however long your material affords you. And I like to put the splice joints between bolt holes because having a, a bolt on each side of that splice is gonna help to hold it together. So you make it so it overlaps a bit. We're overlapped by, oh, about an inch right there. So drop some bolts in here just to hold all that into position. Now, what I do is called the doll head joint, all right? Or it looks like a puzzle piece joint where it's it's rounded and kind of tapered on each, uh, each bottom edge. Round hole punch, and this is where we be very careful because you don't want to hammer all the way through the gasket material and get that sharp edge onto the steel below because you'll dull the tool. But what we want to do is hold it at an angle. We're not trying to punch a round hole. We're just trying to go in and make kind of a semicircle. We go through the first layer. Keep going. All right. And yes, we have a good transfer on the bottom there. So with those pieces stacked on top of one another, take a very sharp blade. And now find the bottom where it just starts curling back in and just work it. Try to get through both layers simultaneously and go to the other side, do it over there as well. Just envision a puzzle piece joint. That's what we're trying to duplicate to a certain extent. All right, we should be through both enough to have made, yes, sufficient marks on the piece underneath. Just help it out with the sharp blade in the corners because that's where the Cuts will have been the lightest. There's one half of it. Second half piece now. Again, just scoring on all of the witness marks. Like I said, we're, we're aiming for like a puzzle piece. All right, so they're gonna fit together. And if you do it correctly, they're gonna wanna hold themselves together just a little bit. This one I could have put a little bit more curl back in on each side, but for the most part, yeah, see, it, it's kind of holding in. For the most part, that is not too bad. Then, as usual, or as always, I would put sealer on that joint just to help it out a little bit. And if you want to do just like uh, a square edged notch that one feeds into the other, that's fine too. That's how I used to do them all the time. until I got so many different punches that I could start putting uh, rounded edges on them. But that's the typical doll head um, splice that I make in gaskets. I keep threatening to take a duplicate one of these and just um, just cut it a little bit off center and then add a couple sharpened wings to each side so I can just set that straight on and go wham and in one shot you do both both pieces. But for the limited amount of times I have to do this, that works out just fine. Okay, a lot of people asked what brand of gasket material do I use and why. I've had good luck and bad luck by just buying whatever the parts store had available until I found this interface brand of gasket material, all right? And you can go on, you can see like this is interface MP15. You can Google that and it'll give you all the specs for the MP15, all right? These are several different grades here, but I've never had a bad gasket using the interface material. This stuff is widely available, but you can see the way I pick it up, these are blanks from production line stampings, okay? And I get this surplus from the Flywheel Supply Company at the Lesseur, Minnesota swap meet every April. And I can, they sell these for like a dollar to two dollars a sheet. All right, that's dirt cheap for gasket material, let alone quality gasket material. I think I even picked up these for 50 cents, you know, but um, I can make tons and tons of gaskets out of this stuff. And like I said, here's our scrap bag. Anytime I have a piece that still looks big enough, I might be able to get something out of yet. Goes in that bag. There's a lot of small gaskets left in there. So this that's dirt cheap for gasket material anyway, let alone quality gasket material, let alone how many hundreds of gaskets I will get 
out of all of these sheets. I even have like some of this Victor Rinse. Most of the time that's pretty good stuff. This is uh, 64 thick or 15,000 sets for setting uh, in play clearances if you might need a really, really thin gasket. And then uh, rubberized cork, sheet cork. I get these from the Mailey Aftermarket. Um, 16th of an inch thick, eighth inch thick. Those two thicknesses pretty much handle everything you need. And this rubberized sheet cork lasts, you know, holds up to just about anything and lasts quite a while as well. So all good stuff there. That being said, it is possible to make gaskets out of a wide range of materials depending on the application. 40 years ago, Senior had to reseal the hydraulic pump on his Alice Chalmers M dozer and he needed a super thin gasket to get the stack height just right. And he ended up using aluminum foil. That's right, tin foil. That's the only thing he had on hand that was thin enough to get the, the pump gear clearance that he wanted. And he thought, well, it only has to get me by through the job in 40 years that pump has not leaked a drop it's still in there so it worked just fine you had flat enough um, housing faces that that's all you needed just a little thin media to go in between help seal it up last summer at the jordan minnesota tractor show we had a d6 that had a carrier roller seize up and stop turning we ended up finding that the end cap had too thin of a gasket under it and it was bound up on the thrust washer so i went back to the camper all i had was a cereal box and a ball peen hammer we sacrificed the cereal box. I tapped out a crude gasket put under the cap and freed that thing right up, held all the grease in just fine. As far as I know, it's still in there going round and round. So it's only temporary unless it works, right? Sealers, final topic and I'll let you all go. Um, I don't have any magic potions. I probably 80% of the time, 90%, I use this Permatex Ultra Black. That's my jack of all trades sealer and I'll put it on any gasket surface on these old tractors because the the surfaces have been compromised a bit they have nicks they have dings burrs even though i try to make sure everything's flat i've just had much better luck if i back both sides of my gaskets up with a very thin coating of this if i have something that is going to have to cope with a little bit more adversity i like this international t442 it's an rtv silicone rubber and i believe it will cope with uh, joint movement of up to 15 thousandths of an inch and remain a viable seal don't put this on anything that you're not prepared to destroy while getting it back apart because this stuff really does its job and does it well and finally here's this um, permatex it's a super 300 forma gasket liquid or sealant liquid sorry this is basically the old the formulation of the old number two non-hardening which they changed that formulation in the modern times. so the super 300 is the modern equivalent of the good old non-hardening permatex and this stuff is resistant to anything known to man so if i need like something in a head gasket area or a manifold anything like that i'll go with this very very good stuff so i think that kind of brings us full circle with everything I wanted to talk about regarding gaskets. Um, practice some of these steps, figure out what works for you, get better and better at it, and then go buy your fancy laser machine and prop your feet up and relax now that you know how to get yourself through in a pinch if your laser machine runs out of electricity. Thank you for watching everyone. I better sign up before I go on a rant about modern times. Thanks. There, it feels so good to have finally gotten that off my chest. <laughs> Thank you for watching, everybody.